viewers, today I want to talk to you about theocratic warfare. Theocratic warfare is a term used in Watchtower publications to refer to a spiritual warfare between Jehovah and his organisation and Satan. But among former Jehovah's Witnesses, the term more specifically applies to the official sanctioning of deception as a strategy when dealing with God's enemies. Specifically, there are a number of instances in Watchtower publications where witnesses are told that lying is acceptable under certain circumstances and in one of these instances, the term theocratic warfare is used, which is why former witnesses like myself use the term theocratic warfare as shorthand for, again, this sanctioning of deception by the organisation. And I will refer you to Watchtower, a Watchtower article from 1960. In the June 1st, 1960 Watchtower on page 352, there was a short article that began as follows. From time to time, letters are received asking whether a certain circumstance would justify making an exception to the Christian's obligation to tell the truth. In reply to these, the following is given. God's word commands, speak truth, each of you, with his neighbour. This command, however, does not mean that we should tell everyone who asks us all he wants to know. We must tell the truth to one who is entitled to know. But if one is not so entitled, we may be evasive, but we may not tell a falsehood. And then later on in the same article, it says, There is one exception, however, that the Christian must ever bear in mind. As a soldier of Christ, he is in theocratic warfare, and he must exercise added caution when dealing with God's foes. Thus, the scriptures show that for the purpose of protecting the interests of God's cause, it is proper to hide the truth from God's enemies. A scriptural example of this is that of Rahab the harlot. She hid the Israelite spies because of her faith in their God Jehovah. This she did both by her actions and by her lips. That she had Jehovah's approval in doing so is seen from James' commendation of her faith. So this article in 1960 links the term theocratic warfare with the act of lying or being evasive for the purpose of furthering God's cause, which, as we know, can be pretty much anything Watchtower or the governing body deem God's cause to be. And you also have in the Insight volumes, the Insight volumes are kind of the, the encyclopedia for Jehovah's Witnesses, but in volume two, under the heading lie, it says the opposite of truth. Lying generally involves saying something false to a person who is entitled to know the truth and doing so with the intent to deceive or to injure him or another person. And then later on, under that heading of lie, it says, while malicious lying is definitely condemned in the Bible, this does not mean that a person is under obligation to divulge truthful information to people who are not entitled to it. And then later on it says, Jehovah God allows an operation of error to go to persons who prefer falsehood that they may get to believing the lie rather than the good news about Jesus Christ. So what we have here is an endorsement of lying or being evasive when it comes to dealing with people who, as far as Watchtower are concerned, are not entitled to the truth. That is what has come to be known as theocratic warfare. It's a little bit similar to with Scientology, where they have what's called fair gaming, where if you're deemed to be an enemy of Scientology, anything goes um, to the point where Scientologists can harass and try to criminally frame people who are deemed to be enemies of the church. 
with Jehovah's Witnesses, it doesn't go quite as far as harassment, but you do still have fair gaming as far as telling the truth is concerned. So if you are deemed to be an apostate, you're not entitled to the truth, or if by telling the truth, the organization, it, shame is brought upon the organization, then it's okay for representatives of the organization to withhold the truth, even to the point of lying, as we're about to see. But this whole policy of theocratic warfare is needless to say, extremely hypocritical when we compare it with watch, what Watchtower has to say about apostates. And I'm now going to play for you a clip from 2016 of Kenneth Flodine, who is a governing body helper, describing apostates as liars. Well, here's a question. Are apostates today as reprehensible as those ones that Jude mentioned in his short letter? Are they devious? Or maybe they're sincerely trying to help poor misguided witnesses. No, they're devious. Have you ever noticed that uh, apostates generally do not try to reason from the scriptures? Why not? Because they know we know the scriptures and we would see through the twisting. Instead, they pick at the organization, they uh, twist truth, they use lies, half-truths to try to grab a mind. Yes, apostates apparently twist truth and use lies and half-truths. And yet, as we've already seen, Watchtower in its publications has said that it's okay to deceive if doing so advances God's cause. So there's a double standard going on here, and you might say utter hypocrisy. And what we're going to do now is we're going to look at four examples of Watchtower officials, so representatives of the organization, telling lies on camera, either in defense of the organization in a legal setting, or in defense of the organization in front of the media. And we're going to begin with Watchtower lawyer David Gnam, who this year in 2018 represented Watchtower before the Canadian Supreme Court. As the meeting progressed with Mr. Wall, the elders came to the decision that Mr. Wall was not sufficiently repentant for his disgraceful conduct and the congregation elders took the decision to disfellowship him. That word is used by Jehovah's Witnesses. They, Jehovah's Witnesses don't use the word shun or shunning. They refer to it as disfellowship, disfellowshipping, disfellowshipped, because that really gives the, the, the sense of what's taking place within this particular religious community. Disfellowship literally means no further spiritual fellowship with the, with the individual. And as I point out, Sorry, Chief Justice. As I point out at paragraph 22 of my factum, the, the nature of the relationship then of a disfellowship person is not completely shunned. The disfellowship person is able to come into the congregation, to the congregation meetings, they're able to attend uh, in the kingdom hall of Jehovah's Witnesses, they're able to sit wherever they like, they can sing the, the spiritual songs with the congregation. As far as their family members are concerned, Normal family relations continue with the exception of spiritual fellowship. And the, the, the door is not closed to Mr. Well either. The person who is disfellowshipped can, after a period of time, ask to be reinstated in the congregation. Because that's the purpose of the discipline. I'm not going to mince my words here. What David Gnam has just said to the Canadian Supreme Court in his official capacity as a lawyer, is an outright lie. And it well illustrates the strategy that I've already detailed that's outlined in Watchtower publications of both evasion and deception. And we've seen both of those here. David Gnam uses evasion by talking about the fact that disfellowshipped people can attend meetings. Oh, well, they can come to the Kingdom Hall and they can receive instruction. But what he's missing out is that, and while they're at the Kingdom Hall, they will be shunned. 
So those who disfellowshipped people who attend Kingdom Hall meetings are literally being shunned by an entire congregation while they are there listening to the talk. And they have to go through this process for months if they want to be considered favourably for reinstatement. So that's evasion. He's painted this picture of a situation that sounds like it isn't shunning when in actual fact it's still shunning just in a different context. And then he tells this outright lie of saying that disfellowshipped ones have normal family relations when any Jehovah's Witness will tell you that that is simply not the case. And to illustrate just how much David Gnam is lying here, I've decided to show you two clips, two recent clips that have been produced by Watchtower to tell Jehovah's Witnesses the extent to which they are to shun disfellowshipped family members. I kept wondering how he was doing. Was he okay? Then, as hard as the past few weeks had been, it just got harder. I knew what the Bible said about quit mixing in company with anyone who is not living according to Christian standards. But I never thought that scripture would one day apply to me. Later that evening, a brother was talking about the example of Korah's sons. Jehovah confirmed that he was using Moses to lead his people, not Korah. When the people were told to move away from the rebels' tents, what would Korah's sons do? Would they put loyalty to family ahead of loyalty to Jehovah? The Bible tells us that his sons remained loyal to Jehovah and were blessed for it. That night, after the meeting, I told Ben about the text I received from Levi. I told him everything. How I miss Levi so much, but that I also wanted to be loyal to Jehovah, like Korah's sons. Ben admitted that he too had been struggling with feelings like mine. But then, he said something that I hadn't thought of. If we were to stand between Levi and the discipline he needs, we would in effect be blocking an expression of Jehovah's love from reaching him. In fact, it's our very loyalty to Jehovah that could save his life. We agreed to continue to put our trust in Jehovah and stay loyal to him. So we have here a married couple who are Jehovah's Witnesses agonizing because their son Levi, who is disfellowshipped, has sent them a text message. According to David Nam, there should be no dilemma here because apparently normal family re relations continue when someone is disfellowshipped. So there should be no reason why the mother can't reply to the text message or why they can't even have a phone call or even have Levi round in the home for a conversation, because apparently normal family relations are continuing in this context. That clearly isn't what's happening here. Watchtower is telling Jehovah's Witnesses that if they have contact with a disfellowshipped family member, even if it's just replying to a text message, they are coming between their family member and loving discipline from Jehovah. And they even invoke the verse about Korah's sons and illustrate the fact that Korah's sons distanced themselves from Korah and his associates, who, by the way, according to the Bible narrative, ended up being destroyed for their apostasy. So this is the, this is the truth that we're seeing now. But when, but when Watchtower is in a legal setting, in a court of law being required to defend its teachings, 
you hear something very different. But we're now going to listen to another example of Jehovah's Witnesses being told the extent to which they need to shun their disfellowshipped family members. My family missed me so much, even after all I had done. What helped them to remain loyal to Jehovah for the many years I was disfellowshipped? It was the Bible account of Aaron. Jehovah directly judged two of Aaron's sons and put them to death. In this case, Jehovah asked Aaron and his family not to mourn in order to show the entire nation that they supported Jehovah's judgment. Mom and Dad saw that they needed to be loyal, just like Aaron. They loved me and wanted me to come back to Jehovah. I tried to contact them. I just wanted to talk and to hear their voice. I missed being with my family. And they thought about reaching out to me. But they knew that if they had associated with me, even a little, just to check on me, that small dose of association might have satisfied me. It could have made me think that there was no need to return to Jehovah. I've already talked about this particular video at length. It is, in my opinion, one of the most disturbing pieces of propaganda that Watchtower has produced. But going back to our discussion, it's unmistakable here what Jehovah's Witness parents are being told. They're being told that if their child is disfellowshipped, there is to be zero contact with them, even to the point where the child is calling them and they can see that it's their child, they are not to pick up the phone. Anything could have been happening to her in that situation. She could have been in dire need of help. And yet the instruction there is, pretend the phone call isn't happening. Pretend your daughter doesn't exist. Pretend that she's dead. But according to David Gnam, who is speaking before the Canadian Supreme Court, oh no, normal family relations continue. As far as their family members are concerned, normal family relations continue with the exception of spiritual fellowship. This again is demonstrably an outright lie, but it's the sort of behavior that Watchtower sanctions when it comes to defending the organization against Satan's system of things. In our second example of a Watchtower representative lying on camera, I want to take you back to 2014 when Vico Linonen, I probably butchered the pronunciation there, Vico Linonen was questioned on Finnish television about the practice of shunning. Mitä sitten, kun lapsi kasvaa, kasvaa nuoreksi ja, ja hiukan aikuistuu, niin, niin voiko hän itse valita, haluaako olla Jehovan todistajissa mukana vai ei? Kyllä, ja se valintahan on nimenomaan itse tehtävä. Ei sitä kukaan muu voi hänen puolestaan tehdä. Voiko hän vapaaehtoisesti sitten vain jättäytyä pois ja alkaa elämään omaa elämää? Totta kai. Aivan vapaaehtoisesti. Ja me toivomme, että hän vapaaehtoisesti tulisi sitä takaisinkin. Ei tule minkäänlaista muuria. Ei aleta siis karttaa Ei. tällaista Ei. pois lähtiä. So if I'm playing devil's advocate here, it could be that Vico has a slightly different scenario in his mind when he's being asked this question, because it isn't made clear whether the child who becomes a youngster is baptized or not. So Vico could have been answering, no, he won't be shunned, he won't be shunned, no, no, no. He could have been giving that emphatic answer with an inactive one in mind. But it's quite, that's, that's quite a stretch to make that defense because quite clearly in the reporter's mind, they're thinking when they say return to Jehovah's Witnesses, the implication is that he is one of Jehovah's Witnesses. In other words, he's been baptized. And we know that Jehovah's Witnesses uh, are increasingly baptizing their children from a very young age. So Vico should have had in his mind uh, 
the the scenario of a young person who is baptized returning he's asked there would such a person be shunned for leaving the religion and he emphatically says no 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 at the very be the very best you could say about this is that it's evasion is that again he's conjured in his mind or he's trying to insist on the person being inactive in this scenario. But really and truthfully, he's lying. The reporter is quite clearly talking about someone who is returning to Jehovah's Witnesses, having left the organisation and given an opportunity to respond as to whether such a person after leaving would be shunned. He says no. That is a lie. And what amazes me about this sort of thing, and there are other examples of Watchtower officials being cornered by the media and asked whether they shun people who leave the organisation. There's now multiple examples of Watchtower officials denying that there is shunning. What I've never been able to figure out is why the shame if this is genuinely God's command, and we saw, we saw that that's how it was portrayed in those dramatizations, well, we're being obedient to God here. We wouldn't want to come between our disfellowshipped loved one and Jehovah's justice, Jehovah's discipline. If this is genuinely from Jehovah, shouldn't they be proud of shunning? Shouldn't they be saying, actually, yes, we do shun, we do uh, limit our association even to the point of not speaking with those who leave our organization or who are disfellowshipped because we want to keep our organization clean and that's what we've been commanded to do by God and we're obedient to God so therefore we shun. Shouldn't they be proud of it? Instead it seems they're quite insecure on this issue. I, I personally think it's their humanity trying to kind of break through that hardened cultish shell because they realize deep down that it is inhumane and they and therefore they know how bad it looks to non-believers when non-believers see the extent to which Jehovah's Witnesses shun so they just can't help themselves but lie but for our third example of lying we're going to move away from shunning and onto the issue of child sex abuse this too is taken from Finnish television, but it's a different Watchtower representative this time. And again, I will murder the pronunciation. Ari Hakarainen, who is speaking to Suzanne Paivarinta on the issue of child sex abuse. No, tota, niin, niin, äh, Miten nämä muut naiset, jotka siinä Ylen jutussa kertovat, niin he sanoivat, että heitä on siis nimenomaan sanottu, että tästä ei saa puhua, näistä asioista ei saa puhua eteenpäin ja estetty viemästä viranomaisille, niin kuin Josefinakin sanoi, että tästä asiasta ei sitten saa puhua muille. Mutta tekisi että tämä ei missään tapauksessa pidä paikkaansa, mutta mä en tiedä sitten jotain yksittäistä tapausta, en tiedä. Mutta missään tapauksessa ei kielletä, jos joku on vaikkapa raiskauksen uuden. Meillä on ollut lehdissä jo kauan aikaa, jossa nimenomaan sanotaan, että pitää kertoa viranomaisille. Lasten seksuaalinen hyväksikäyttö ehdottomasti viranomaisille. Sitten Aivan ehdottomasti. Et ei, ei minkäänlaista jakoa, että niitä yritäisi salailla. Mm. Mutta tota, eikö esimerkiksi lasten seksuaalinen hyväksykäyttö ole teillä ohjeistettu, katsoin vuoden 2017 syyskuulta tämmöistä ohjeistusta, niin, niin siinä sanotaan vain, että pitää ottaa tämmöisen, jos joku saa tietonsa tällaisen tapauksen, niin seurakunnan vanhimpiin on otettava yhteys ää, tota, valtakunnalliseen päämajan, eli tähän haaratoimistoon. Te kehotatte toimimaan näin. Öö, isä ja äiti, jos lasta on käyty hyväksi, niin totta kai heidän tulee kertoa siitä viranomaisille. viranomaisille. Sitten jos tämä jotenkin liittyy seurakuntaan, tämä tapaus, jos se, vaikka se syyllinen on vaikka seurakunnassa, niin silloin on tietysti hyvä, että seurakuntakin tietää, että voidaan suojella toisiaan. Niin sitten se, että siinä ohjeistuksessa sanotaan, että nyt niiden vanhin tulee ensiksi soittaa haaratoimistoon, niin se syy on aina se, että, että, heidät, että he varmasti kertoo sen viranomaisille. Mm. Että meillä on siellä sitten lakiosasto, joka nimenomaan sanoo, että nyt se ensimmäinen tehtävä, mikä teidän on, niin pitää kertoa viranomaisille. Mm, Tämä on nimenomaan sen takia just, että se varmasti menee viranomaisille. Okei, okay. mä vielä jankkaan, koska mä katson tätä tota ohjeistusta, niin mä ymmärsin, että siinä, ei siinä sanota noin, Ari, että siinä sanotaan, että, että tota, pitää nimenomaan 
olla yhteydessä tota, haaratoimistoon. Ei, ei, ei sanota siinä, että ottakaa yhteyttä viranomaisiin. Siinä missä luet, että ottakaa viranomaisiin. Miksi ette kehota ottamaan on, yhteyttä viranomaisiin? On, on meillä sitten on meidän julkaisussa ollut jo aikaisemmin, jo niin pidemmältä ajalta ollut, ollut ohje, että ottaa viranomaisiin. Mutta se, missä julkaisussa niin, niin julkaisu, teillä on ää, sitten sellaisia ohjeita? Vartiotorissa. Mutta jos ihmiset eivät lue niitä vartiotorneja, että kun teillä on omat ohjeet kuitenkin. Tämä on niin sikäli niin mielenkiintoista, että, tätä, että mä uskon, että tämä on aika lailla kaikille johonnollistajille selvää, että, että jos... Nämä siis tapaukset ovat tosi harvinaisia. Todella harvinaisia. So again, in this example you have both evasion and outright deception, an outright lie. So Ari is defending the organization to Suzanne, and they're talking about a specific case where a victim was told not to go to the authorities by the elders. Ari, as a Watchtower representative, is saying, well, we would never do that. You know, there's no way that the organization would tell a victim that they are not to go to the authorities about their abuse. Now, this is evasion because currently, the current policy that Watchtower has been forced to implement is that elders are not to discourage a child abuse victim from going to the authorities. But that doesn't mean that has always been the case. So in this, in this specific instance, it's very likely that the victim was dissuaded from going to the authorities because in past cases that has happened where elders have told victims no you're not to report to the authorities and if you do we could take action against you you could be found guilty of slander that has happened and just to highlight the fact that watchtower does cover up child abuse and does try to stop abuse from being reported to the authorities. There was recently a story that was published in a newspaper in Ireland about an elder who was actually removed from his role for independently going to report an accusation or a known pedophile to the local authorities. He was removed from his role by Watchtower. So that's the extent to which the organization tries to cover things up and tries to make sure that where possible abuse is kept from the authorities. You're not going to hear anything about that from Ari. He's there to defend the organization. And if it means talking about current policy as though it's applicable everywhere and as though it's always been applicable, he is more than comfortable doing that. But Ari also employs theocratic warfare strategy in this interview by telling an outright lie when he says that Watchtower publications have repeatedly told parents or victims to go to the authorities. This apparently, if you look up child abuse or child molestation in the magazines or in the literature, you're going to find, apparently, articles or uh, pages that tell victims to go to the police. I'm sorry, but while you can say that Watchtower has published a tremendous amount of material on child sex abuse going back a number of decades, which apparently makes the organisation more culpable, in my view, because if they've been warning about child sex abuse going all the way back to the 80s, they can't then argue that this whole thing has taken them by surprise and they're struggling to adapt because they've been talking about it for all these decades. They should be on top of the situation. But one thing that you cannot say about Watchtower material on child abuse is that it warns victims or parents of victims to go to the authorities. I would ask, if you're watching this as a Jehovah's Witness, don't take my word for it. Go and look at the material itself and see if you can find a sentence or a paragraph that tells victims to go to the police. That's my challenge for you. But just to indicate or give some hint of the fact that you will not find that, I'm going to show you 
Uh, questions young people ask, answers that work, volume one. This was published, let me see, in, tw in 2011 this came out. So this is fairly recent material published for young people. It has an entire section, how can I protect myself from sexual predators? So you'd think this would be the section, wouldn't you? Where it says, if you are attacked by a sexual predator, what you need to do is go to the police or go to the authorities. Guess what? That's not what it says. So you have a section here telling your story. And it talks about going to the elders. So it says, in fact, if you are a Christian, it is important that you speak to a congregation elder about what happened. If you flick on, it talks about speaking to supportive friends. It speaks about uh, taking care of yourself physically and emotionally. Get needed rest. It says, rely on Jehovah, the God of all comfort, uh, who will soon bring about a new world in which evildoers themselves will be cut off. What you will not find anywhere, and believe me, you can check for yourself, read this whole section, nowhere does it say, go to the authorities, go to the police, make sure that this sexual predator is brought to justice so that he doesn't attack anyone else, which is the whole point of reporting, to make sure that the awful tragedy isn't replicated again and again and again. But going back to Ari's interview with Suzanne, he tells the bold-faced lie that in material such as this, it tells victims of abuse to go to the authorities when it just doesn't. And as my final example of Watchtower deploying theocratic warfare when cornered on its teachings and policies, I have to include the footage from the Australian Royal Commission back in 2015, when governing body member, a member of the composite faithful and discreet slave, was brought before the Australian Royal Commission and had the following exchange with senior counsel Angus Stewart. So is it the case then that someone who no longer wants to be recognised as or known as one of Jehovah's Witnesses uh, must then disassociate? Uh, no, it doesn't say they must do anything. Uh, if you read on, you'll see there's a process. Uh, this gives the person the right to officially have an announcement made that they're no longer one of Jehovah's Witnesses. But as I already said, if they decide they don't want to exercise that right, uh, they don't automatically come under this provision. People who don't exercise that right are then, in other words, they, as you described, inactive. They still subject to the rules and discipline of the organisation, aren't they? Um, I, I would have to check on that because personally, I, that's not my field. But my understanding is if a person has made it uh, known by their actions in the community over a period of years that they're not witnesses, we would only uh, hold any reports in abeyance until they decided they wanted to return. Well, um, Mr. Jackson, I have to say that my understanding is as if someone in that position uh, is caught transgressing one of the rules, then they would still be subject to the disciplinary procedures, including possibly disfellowshipping. Is that not right? And that is a possibility, but I, in all fairness uh, to your question, uh, I think there are circumstances that uh, I couldn't make a de definitive comment on that. Yes. And so, for example, if they had become inactive or sought to fade without formally dissociating, uh, and the elders came to visit and found them celebrating Christmas or a birthday, they would be found to be in transgression of the rules, would they not? Uh, that is not my understanding. Uh, uh, but again, as I said, it's not my field. Uh, that goes into policy with regard to uh, uh, those type of things. Uh, but from my personal experience, that's not the case. Well, 
Mr. Sneed, say it, it's not your field, but you remember the governing body, which is responsible, as you've said, for the whole field, and you've been a member for 10 years, and all the committees are, are responsible to and accountable to the governing body. So it, that is correct. So it is your field, isn't it? So this exchange was just one of many examples of Geoffrey Jackson either being evasive or outright lying. And if you haven't seen the footage yet, I'll put links in the description. Go and watch the full testimony of Geoffrey Jackson before the Royal Commission being questioned as he was here by Senior Counsel Angus Stewart. But I've zeroed in on this particular exchange because it is probably, well, in my view, it is the most clear example of an outright lie. Angus Stewart very cleverly, in my opinion, carefully worded his question so that Geoffrey Jackson could either lie or tell the truth. Because Angus Stewart had done his homework, he knew the difference between an inactive person and a disassociated person, so he made sure that Geoffrey Jackson knew that what he was talking about here was an inactive person, someone who had faded. And then he says to Geoffrey Jackson, what about a situation where elders call on a, on a faded, inactive Jehovah's Witness who's baptised still, as far as the elders are concerned, a member of the congregation. They call on him and he's celebrating either Christmas or a birthday. What would happen? And Jeffrey Jackson responds by line number one. He says, that's not my field. I wouldn't know. What would I know about that? And he goes one step further and says, as far as I'm concerned, that's not what would happen. That, In other words, they wouldn't disfellowship that person. Well, it's a lie for Jeffrey Jackson to say, that's not my field, because as Angus Stewart himself points out, he's a governing body member. It's his responsibility, along with the other governing body members, to approve all the different policies and make sure they are in line with what the scriptures say. So it absolutely is his field. He was caught out with that lie. And then he says, um, I, don't think, uh, I don't think they would get disfellowshipped. Well, here is the Shepherd the Flock of God book. And let's remember, shall we, that Jeffrey Jackson, as well as being a governing body member, he's also an elder. All governing body members are elders. Jeffrey Jackson has his own personal copy of this book, The Shepherd, the Flock of God book. On page 65, along with other grounds for disfellowshipping, you have there a section, Apostasy. And what's the first item under that list of apostasy? Celebrating false religious holidays. So you can be disfellowshipped for celebrating a false religious holiday. In other words, Christmas. But when it's convenient for him to forget that, he will forget it. Or he will just tell an outright lie, as he says here, that as far as he's concerned they wouldn't be disfellowshipped in that situation. So there you have four examples of Watchtower officials on camera lying or, or at best evading, giving evasive comments that are designed to be red herrings, to throw people off the scent, to confuse the questioner, to make the questioner doubt themselves. And, and think that they probably don't know what they're talking about. This is sanctioned behaviour from the publications, because as we saw at the beginning, Watchtower publications entitle someone to withhold the truth from someone who is not entitled to know when it benefits God's cause. So that's the sort of organisation we're dealing with here. And let's remember Kenneth Flodine's words that apostates apparently are guilty of lies and half-truths. Well, there you see the hypocrisy. And that's what 
uh, ex-Jehovah's Witness activists like myself are up against. Because I cannot publish a video <laughs> about Watchtower giving my honest thoughts about the organisation and its harmful policies without some Jehovah's Witness commenting, all of this is lies. This person is lying about our organisation. Well, I think in future I'm going to direct them to this video. You want to talk about lies? Let's talk about lies. Your organisation lies about child abuse and it lies about shunning. And on both of those issues, it should be proud of its policies if those policies come from God. Because in the Bible, the prophets of Jehovah went through persecution and assassination rather than stand down on their proclamations, rather than water down their message. They were prepared to really pay for telling it like it is and saying what Jehovah's judgments were, even if it meant being killed for expressing those judgments. But when push comes to shove, when you put a governing body member or a Watchtower lawyer or a Watchtower PR representative in front of a court of law or in front of a television camera, suddenly everything gets watered down. Suddenly the shame starts to manifest itself and they can't quite bring themselves to be quite so proud of Jehovah's commands. So, <laughs> quite a lot to digest there, but I hope that you've found some or all of this material useful. I should just mention that this video was requested, was one of the requested voted for videos by my Patreon supporters, so I'd like to thank them for urging me to make this video or prioritizing it over other videos. Thank you very much indeed. But uh, I hope that you have found this information useful. Please don't forget to subscribe for more videos. And as always, thank you for watching.